I was very lucky as a boy in my childhood. No matter what, however little money my parents didn't have, my mum always secreted enough money away once a year to take us to the pantomime, to give us an introduction to the magic of theatre. Now, if my memory serves me well, my first remembrance of it is Dick Whittington, which could have been on ice in the Alhambra Theatre. And I, I don't remember what age I was, but anyway, Dick skates on to the stage with the longest, sexiest, most beautiful legs you've ever seen in the world and not a dick in sight. Then, next minute, on comes a truck driver dressed as a woman with a woman's um, gown on, massive pair of false breasts and great wig and bright red, li red lipstick. And Dick turns around to her and says, Hi, Mum. <laughs> How's your day? Talk about gender confusion in a young boy's mind and heart and soul. But that magic has never, ever left me. Um, and that was very special. Um, later on, when I, was a, when I was a teenager, it's why I think it, it, pantomime was vital for young people. We must, I mean, even if people, get, you know, if families can't afford it, we must let children in for free. Because the first time you experience, you know, the, the lights, the glitter, the glamour, the songs, the dances, the pratfalls, the sheer scale of a pantomime, the sheer joy of a pantomime, there's nothing like it, and you never forget it. Uh, I was then lucky in my teenage years when um, just before and just after and, and during the time I went to drama school, I had a girlfriend then called Eleanor who was the secretary to Jimmy Logan, the comedian. Uh, just as he had uh, set up his, bought the Metropole Theatre with his dad, Jack Short, and were doing pantomimes and variety shows and everything else. And I was in a very privileged position of being able to stand in the wings and watch Jimmy Logan, a wonderful, wonderful artist like him, have the audience in the palm of their hands every night. And that was, that was very special. I was at drama school, and this was, must have been, oh, 68, 1967, 68, 69, whatever. And I went to the Citizens Theatre to see The Tempest. And a man called Richard Kane played Ariel. And he came on in a sort of Michelin Man outfit that was all white, that was like a massive great puffer jacket. And he moved and walked in slow motion. Everyone else round about him was normal speed. And there was this dreamlike, angelic, ghost-like, ethereal creature flitting across the stage while delivering the lines at normal speed. And for me, it, I guess it was my first introduction to the magic of physical theater. I've always been a very physical actor. And in my 10 years at, uh, at the Citizens Theater, during those wonderful years, I, I, that was a joy for me to express myself physically as well as, as vocally and verbally and, and intellectually and emotionally. It's a tool that we have as actors. And to see Richard, whom I didn't know at all, he was a diminutive little actor. I don't believe he's no longer, I believe he's no longer with us, bless him, but uh, that, always, that always stuck in my mind and, and in many ways influenced the, the style of acting that I, I, I then evolved uh, for myself. The production that maybe inspired me most, or was most memorable, was the uh, Arturo Ui with uh, Leonard Rossiter and that very powerful piece about the rise of fascism and the rise of monstrosity and totalitarianism and just the graphic nature of that production and the message that hit you, there was no subtlety about it, hit you between the short and curlies. Uh, and that I'll never forget. Within the next couple of years, I would love to be involved in either directing or acting in one of the American classics. Because during all my time in theater, I've never had a chance to do it. Like Willie Loman, you know, you've got Death of a Salesman, you've got All My Sons, you've got uh, you know, The Iceman Cometh, you've got great pieces of, of work by, by wonderful American writers writing about the blue collar workers and the moral dilemmas that, that they go through and, and, the, and the pressures of capitalism upon them. And I think they're fascinating, character-driven pieces. And I would love to, uh, and I'm already talking to Dominic Hill that we may do something together uh, in that way. Um, but definitely that, that is as an actor, but also as a director. But as a director, I would love to direct just because I think it's always, uh, it's always in the, f the forefront of, 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 uh, I mean, of my awareness, is I want to do something like uh, Over the Lovely War. 
I love the way it was conceived in Joan Littlewood's workshop in those wonderful heady days. Um, and those extraordinary actors created by, by a, a bunch of performing artists who come together and express a vision and an attitude uh, about something which is vitally, vitally important to us all. And I think lest we forget, we should constantly be reminded of the horrors of war. Um, so I would, uh, that's, on my, that's on my hit list as a, as a, as a, as a director. My favourite actor of all time, I think, is Humphrey Bogart. And he's a film actor. And I don't believe that Bogie ever set foot on stage. But for, I, I could have been wrong. But the integrity, the efficiency that he, and the minimalism that he brought to conveying a myriad of emotions and and attitudes and everything else on screen, uh, for me, is just the best example of screen acting. Him, him and uh, Marlon Brando. So I guess if, if I'm saying Brando, then I would love to have seen him on either of those gentlemen on stage. <laughs>